Hey everyone, welcome to the Canada Technologist. I'm your host, Rob Neely. And uh, with us today, we've got uh, Patrick Kolos. Patrick, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, yes, uh, Kolos. Kolos. Very good. You're a field application specialist with a seasoned company called Bucci. Um, Bucci is a, a, a leading solution provider uh, in laboratory technology for R&D, quality control, production worldwide. So uh, thanks for being here today, Patrick. How are you doing? Uh, very well. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you, Rob. Fantastic. I'll just get, dive right into it. I'm, I'm curious as a field application specialist for Bucci, you know, I would imagine in any given day, you're going to be working with clients in pharmaceutical, biotech, or uh, emerging cannabis industries. Um, can you tell us a bit about your role? Absolutely. So the uh, field application specialist is a relatively new position in Bucci Corporation. But we are responsible for all the installs and all the trainings across our air diverse product portfolio. So we have 11 product sets ranging from chromatography to NIR spectroscopy, evaporation, so a very diverse product set. We pretty much work with anybody that uses chemistry in their process. Um, I got a very diverse client base as well, so big pharma, oil, the cannabis industry, nutraceutical, food and feed. We uh, interact with a lot of different industries doing a lot of different processes. Uh, when it yeah. comes to trainings, these are going to be geared towards that individual customer. So, for example, if I go in to a cannabis company, there are some industry standards that I will teach them. Well, I'll typically spend one or two days helping them reach their product goals and needs, which are different depending on the company. It's interesting you bring that up about standards in cannabis because lots of times there is no standards. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, or are they, in your experience, just constantly evolving? Um, is, is it a moving platform, or, or what? So that is going to be dependent on what state that I'm visiting in. Uh, right now, the big okay. trends in the cannabis industry are going to be purity of the uh, other individual cannabinoids, as well as pesticide removal. So the immediate threat and concern in the industry is going to be uh, the regulation of pesticides by those individual states because the levels and the identities of the pesticides are going to change depending on the governing body in that state. Right. Right. So it's very geocentric. I could I could see that being the case. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of in terms of production and processing systems for cannabis, what kind of growth have you seen? With, uh, with Bucci's large-scale distillation solutions, such as the Rotovapor R220 Pro? So with our uh, Brafarib solutions, uh, we've seen a lot of growth into uh, uh, markets for solvent recovery for cannabis. Um, specifically, uh -huh. we're I think we're using our Rotovaps right after winterization to recover ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, or whatever their winterizing solvent of choice is. And then we've also been tying that in with recovering samples after performing chromatography. So with those two processes, you are going to use a lot of solvents. And as most people are aware, solvent costs are going to be a pretty big capital investment. So if you're able to recover a decent amount of that back, you can really lower your, your operating costs. Yeah. Bushi offers solutions to separate and purify, you know, small to, to large size batches of extracts using the uh, the Revelaris chromatography system. So what is the importance of the separation of cannabinoids for medical and recreational use in your preview? Uh, so what I've been seeing generally is people are either wanting to have a high purity of THC or a high purity of CBD. So THC is going to be your recreational market. CBD is going to be your medical, your medical product. Uh, with the Revelaris, you are able to separate into separate out individual cannabinoid classes. So you're going to have a THC fraction, a CBD fraction, and then a THCA fraction, assuming that you didn't decarboxylate the entire sample. Um, the other main thing uh, with the Revelaris, as I mentioned before, is going to be pesticide removal, and you're able to do. Right. Complete, you're able to do complete pesticide removal as well as isolation with one run, which is very attractive to our customers. So instead of 
doing multiple processes, one to remove the pesticides, then one to isolate out the cannabinoids. They're able to do this all with one system at the same time. And it doesn't take an incredible amount of skill once the program is set up by a chemist or by myself okay. or one of my colleagues. Uh, the system is very, very user-friendly, easy to use. It's interesting you bring that up. I just got back from the uh, marijuana uh, business conference and, and learned much more about chromatography and the merits of it. And it's, it seems to be this emerging, I wouldn't say silver bullet, but it's a pretty exciting new technology. Do you think that's kind of where the future is going to be? Um, so one thing I will say about the cannabis industry is it still is very immature, but it can borrow a lot from big pharma. So a lot of uh -huh. the pharmaceutical products that are on the market now have to use chromatography to separate out and get the purities that they need to be approved by the FDA. Um, right. The upfront cost of chromatography is expensive. You don't do chromatography unless you have to. But in the cannabis market, I think if you're dealing with pesticides and you need those high purity of those individual cannabinoids, um, it has to be chromatography. There's really no way around it. But chromatography... Yeah for fatty molecules like uh, THC and CBD has been around for a very long time, so it's not a new science. I just think it needs to be adapted to the industry. Okay. I hear what you're saying. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm curious how flexible and easy is it to operate evaporators? Um, and they, can they gradually be invested in too? So... Uh, for our evaporation line, uh, Bukki is actually the company that invented the rotor vapor, but we've clearly made a number of improvements. Our current line has a touchscreen interface that you can control all uh -huh. the accessories, so the chiller and the vacuum pump from that touchscreen. With that touchscreen, there's also a feature that a lot of our users like called the solvent library, where you pick what solvent you're using, you hit it, and it will run a pre-programmed method that is optimized for that solvent. It takes a lot of the guesswork out having to program a method yourself. Uh, that being said, typically, if somebody has me out for a training, I would also make a customized method for them using the programming on that interface. So very, very easy to use. Um, uh -huh. And everything can be controlled from one, one touchscreen interface. So relatively easy for users that aren't terribly... Um, tech savvy. Is know-how a big part of what you do in educating folks on how to do exactly that, even though it's easy as you say it is? Yeah, typically when I would go in for training, my goal is to make sure that they understand how to develop a process. So I don't have to teach them everything about that specific topic in chemistry. They just have to understand the road that their company needs to go down to have the the most cost-effective and the highest quality um, procedure programs into that, uh, into that roadmap. Okay. Can you tell us about other Bucci solutions for, for further processing cannabis, such as spray drying or encapsulation? I mean, you guys have your fingers in a lot of pies. Hmm. So uh, spray drying and encapsulation is by no means a new technology. Uh, Big Pharma has been doing it for a while, uh, as well as people in uh, food and feed. So spray dried milk, spray dried nutraceuticals, a number of different things. Um, I myself personally have done a decent amount of work in spray drying with the individual cannabinoids, as well as my colleagues in Flaville. So the main... Uh -huh. The main goal of spray drying is to increase something's water solubility, um, extend its shelf life, protect fragrance, things along those lines. Along those lines. Uh, so what you basically do is you're wrapping up your compound of interest in a compound or a mixture of compounds called an excipient. Uh, the last time I did a little bit of research, we were able to make a free-flowing THC powder dissolved in a uh, specific excipient, as well as a free-flowing CBD powder spray-dried and a uh, different excipient. And both of these were isolated from our Revel R system, so we were able to tie in multiple products to create a process. Okay. Um, as, far, as far as encapsulation, so encapsulation is a little different 
of a technology, but you accomplish the same thing. So you extend shelf life, you're wrapping it up in a compound. Uh, for encapsulation, you can do two different things. So you can make a core shell particle. So think of your compound in the middle covered in a thin shell of an excipient, typically a polymer or something like alginate. Or you can create sort of a agglomeration like cookie dough where it's interdispersed. Uh, yeah. When I was working with our colleagues in Flaville, we were able to do that with THC and CBD relatively easily. Okay. Interesting. Um, can you, well, what are your biggest challenges? I mean, as, as a field application specialist, um, you know, you've been across a number of segments and verticals. Um, what are your biggest challenges as it relates to cannabis? I mean, how, how long have you been in it? And, and I'd like to get you to reflect on that. So I've been working um, with my current company for nearly two years now. Um, and since then, I really hit the ground running with the cannabis industry. Uh, we have, as I said, we work in multiple industries, but they have been one of our biggest growing sectors. Uh -huh. uh, I would say one of, one of the issues that we do see is so our corporate office is in Delaware. Um, so getting things tested and shipping is clear an issue because there's not a standard legal status across states. But fortunately, it just became recreationally legal in California, and we do have a decent number of staff in California, so we're able to have access to labs and things along those lines. But the uneven legal footing across the U.S. does present some, some hurdles for uh, moving as quickly as I think a lot of people would like to. Sure. Um, the other thing that we're all seeing, so I'm originally from Virginia, where it's still um, considered a so not recreationally legal for cannabis products. And there's still a stigma tied to the industry for people working in chemistry. So if you're in big pharma, you work for anybody else who's just gotten out of college, there's still a stigma in states where it's not recreationally legal. And I do see that as being a bit of a hurdle for the industry. Because you're not bringing in skilled formulation chemists or pharmaceutical chemists at the rate that you would see in another industry. I think what's likely to happen is the trend for legalization, if it continues the way that it has been, that stigma will kind of go away. But as it stands now, I think the accessibility to higher skilled chemists is kind of limited to the industry. And that, that is something that I've seen when I'm performing trainings and things along those lines, that there's a big variation in skill levels, which isn't common in other chemistry industries. Yeah, I could see that. Which is a nice segue into to, uh, kind of my last question, um, you know, when cannabis leaves Schedule 1 or, or when legalization becomes more and more prevalent, how do you see being a field application specialist changing um, in cannabis? Does it just become homogenized with all the other verticals that you guys are in, or are there going to be some unique nuanced spaces only for cannabis? Can you talk a little bit about that? So I would say, yeah, I would say as the industry develops more, there's going to be, I suspect we'll be offering specialized products. Uh, we've already, we've already got a number of modifications to our existing portfolio that work well with cannabis, but I expect as it matures, grows, and the demands of the industry become more clear, businesses are going to follow suit and provide the solutions that they need. Um, what I do see happening with the cannabis industry is similar to what has happened with the craft beer industry. So there's a lot of mom and pop shops. Everybody and their brother is making products in their garage in the new states that just become legal. But there are a few big players that have sort of white glove labs, a lot of investors, things along those lines. I suspect that eventually it's going to become consolidated into a few big companies and they're going to be at the standard that you see with other, other mature industries where it's going to be highly regulated GMP manufactured lab, things along those lines. That's an analogy I've heard before comparing it to the craft, the craft brewing mm -hmm. phenomenon. But what's different to me is, is prohibition allowed, you know, the, the evolution of uh, alcohol laws allowed for the big breweries to exist. And it was only when the laws came down in the 70s did, did microbrewery phenomenons pop up because there was a drive for quality. 
Um, and in this situation, it feels like we're starting on the opposite end, small independent mom and pops. And, uh, mm. but the trend may be what you described as, as the bigger companies coming in uh, to being able to regulate. Um, and be able to produce mm. on a wider volume. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, one thing that I will say is right now in the market, there's a demand for some people that just want lower quality products. There are people that want the black label products, so they want 97% THC in the product. Right. Um, yeah. They want it to taste exactly like the flower, or some people want it to taste like blueberry. There's different demands in the industry. So I would say it's similar to what you see in tobacco. So some people with um, in vaping want something to taste like tobacco, but they don't want to smoke actual cigarettes. And some people want sure. their vape to taste like Captain, want their vape to taste like Captain Crunch. And I think you do and will continue to see that diversification in cannabis as well. So there, there's definitely room for smaller, smaller companies that are going to produce a high quality specialty product. But you will, you will uh-huh. definitely see some bigger players come in and uh, mass produce products as well. Good point. And the other exciting element to all this is that it's such a undiscovered plant. I mean, it's been around for 5,000 years, and there's still so much about what it has to offer that we don't know yet. Um, so who's to say what's coming mm-hmm. down the pipe? Interesting stuff. Uh, no, I, uh, I definitely agree. A lot of the medical research on the plant that is still federally illegal is inconclusive. There's... Yeah. Inclusive studies that talk about um, individual cannabinoids acting as antiproliferants, uh, which would be helpful in treating cancer. Um, a number, a number of different promising drug molecules are in the plant, but it's still federally illegal um, as it stands now. None of that is validated, so, so, so a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely, Patrick. This has been a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Your wealth of knowledge. Um, I'd like to direct our, our uh, listeners to uh, the ability to find you or, or learn more about Gucci. How would you direct them? So I'd say you can go to uh, www.bookie.com and uh, find our website and then reach out, look through our product portfolio. Uh, there should be a link in there to uh, request some information. Mm-hmm. And then one of our, one of our representatives could uh, get in contact with you directly. Well, I've been their website. It's certainly impressive. It shows kind of the wide breadth of verticals you guys are in. So great stuff. Patrick, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time. Can we do this again sometime? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Rob. Fantastic. That's it, everyone. Thanks for listening. See you next time.